Hi. I just saw your message. Sorry, I was <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Campisi. Oh, yeah, call me Laura, please. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Laura. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Now, thank you. Thank you for your interest in my, in my work. <laughs> We'll start in around 10 minutes, so um, you still have some time to relax. We just opened the room earlier to make sure everything works and stuff. So. Okay. Um, Katarina, please check the link to see if it works. I think this one works, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I I think I have to compress it because it says you cannot preview it. So let me, I think I, I made earlier a compressed version. Let me just add it to the Google Drive. Okay. It's nice to have you with us, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> I try to understand how I can uh, unmute myself in the meantime. Oh, I'm not really, I I'm discovering this thing with you guys. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Um, the mute and unmute button is the, in the bottom right corner. You can see a microphone when you click it. Um, yeah, now you're muted. Now you unmute it. <laughs> Yeah, so now you're muted, and when you click it again, you're unmuted.
Hi, Jamie. Greetings. Hello. How are you today? Good. Or this afternoon or this evening or whatever it is. <laughs> Time zones. <laughs> Uh, we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. I have everything set up now. Very warm welcome to you, Doctor. So glad you could join us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Have you had a good day today so far? Yeah, you know, like in science, up and down. <laughs> that's a, that's a, yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay, we're just sharing the room and everything, and we'll probably get started in a moment. Okay, uh, can you hear me or do I have too much background noise? Should Cecilia hear him do the introduction? You're, you're sounding okay uh, to me. Um, we're hearing some background sounds, but nothing overwhelming. Is every, does anyone else hear? Yeah, no, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone to the Science Society and a special welcome, of course, to Laura. Thank you so much for coming and uh, we really appreciate it. And for making the Clubhouse account and coming here, we really appreciate it. And Thank you guys for your interest. Yeah, let me, um, before we start, let me introduce you a little bit um, to the audience. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Laura Campisi, she's an um, assistant professor in microbiology at um, the Icon School of Medicine and, at Mount Sinai. And um, she uh, did her Bachelor of Science at the University of Nice, Sofia, Antipolis, and uh, her master's degree also at the University of Nice, Sofia, Antipolis and um, her PhD in immunology, also at the University of New Sofia Antipolis. And then later she did um, various postdoc uh, positions and the latest was at Mount Sinai Medical Center where she is now an assistant professor um, at the School of Medicine. And um, yeah, she does really interesting uh, research and we are so honored to having you here sharing your amazing work. And um, before we start though with your presentation, um, uh, you, um, Cecilia Hume will ask you a couple of interview questions if that's okay. And um, yep, we'll go from sure, there. Sure. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, Laura. Um, yeah, we'd just like to ask a couple of questions just so we can get to know you a little bit more. Um, so the first question I ask, I have to uh, have for you is just wondering, um, when did you discover your love for science um, and how did you nurture that interest into what it is today? It's, it's, I honestly, I don't really know when did, when my love for science started, I guess like my father is um, a doctor, a medical doctor, 
Um, but I did like the high school, I did the humanity. Uh, but um, I, I, st- I don't know, I, I always been curious. And um, I did one year of medical school. And when I was in medical school, I actually, I, I started thinking that I, I wouldn't like to be um, like a doctor, like in a hospital, but I would like to do research because uh, I like better, like everything that was like cellular biology, everything that has a mechanism in there. And so then, then I moved to the faculty in, in France because I'm Italian, but I studied in France with biochemistry. And, and yeah, it just started like that. And I did some, um, I, I was going during the summer, I was going to work for free, like to learn in laboratories. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know if there is a time but I really discovered my passion for, for science. I just, I think it was a process, like, just like, it started to growing uh, over the years. Uh, no, I totally understand um, when you said what you said. It just made so much sense to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> almost like a process of elimination. You tried different things and then you figured out, oh, this is what you know suits me best. But yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. Um, and also, I just wanted to ask about this particular research topic that you will be sharing with us here. Um, and just how did you you know, arrive at it? What was your process to get to this one? How did your interests uh, develop for this one as well? Uh, okay, so that's maybe uh, something that I I'm, I already integrated in my presentation because I thought that, uh, yeah, of course I can present my paper, but my paper is out so everybody can read. So the way I I'm, I decide to make my my presentation, it's about that, like how I oh, did and okay. okay. that, doing that, because it, yeah, it's a field that is completely different from what I was doing before. But oh, no, yeah, no. So in I that think case, it, I think we should just go straight into it. Yeah. So you can go ahead and, you know, tell your story the way that you feel comfortable telling it. And yes, and again, I thought it, maybe for the audience would be more interesting to know, like, this is it's a kind of an, a chronological order, which is something that we never do. When we write a paper, we always write, like, in a way that the story is the sexiest as possible. But um, I thought it would be interesting to see, uh, like chronologically, how I ended up finding what I found. So um, I guess you guys have the PDF. And uh, yeah, so like I'm, I'm going through this PDF right now. And um, yeah, so my work, the work I've been published is about this population of CD80 cells that um, are characterized a form of neurodegenerative disease that is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis four. And so how I ended up working on that, I am an immunologist and I work in a department of microbiology. And so that my lab is a lab that works like the lab of my mentor, Ivan Marazzi. Um, it's a lab was more focused on discovering epigenetic factors that regulate the inflammation. And so people in the lab, they were screening for these regular, for regulators of viral infection using influenza virus. And uh, they ended up uh, discovering that these gene attacks, which encoded for the um, protein that, that, call, that is called senataxin. Uh, so that senataxin regulates the expression of inflammatory genes during influenza infection. And like in my, I just put one figure showing that when you take, when you take uh, cells, uh, you deplete the tax, you do a no, uh, knockout of the tax, then you infect these cells. You have uh, an increased expression of an interferon and IRF3 dependent genes. And that was the story published by the lab. But what is interesting is that these protein senataxin, it has been it has been also linked to neurodegeneration. And so senataxin is um, a protein that is ubiquitously expressed. Um, is a, an RNA DNA helicase, and it's mainly known because of the uh, role in the resolution of the um, R loops during transcription. And I mean, there are several, you can see in my slides, like several functions that have been described for this protein, uh, but uh, mm, included what has been shown by the lab of my mentor, it's um, a regulation of the mm, uh, transcription inflammatory genes. Um, 
So it's interestingly, Setax is mutated in two forms of uh, um, disease, neurologic disease. So there are patients that have mutation that lead to a lack of expression of this protein. And so this patient, they have this disease that is called AOA2 for ataxia or choropraxia 2. And then there they are patients that express a mutated form of this protein and so, in this patient, they develop what is uh, um, uh, called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis 4, which is a juvenile, um, slow progressive form of ILS. And so, when I joined the lab and, and I saw that as an immunologist, I thought it was interesting this fact, the fact that this protein that was just discovered as a regulator of the immune system was also involved in uh, um, um, neurodegeneration. So, and I started like trying to um, understand better um, um, this disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And I, I have to say, this, uh, um, this is not one disease, it's a group of disease, but the, mainly what they have in common is that uh, you have the generation of uh, um, motor neurons, which are these neurons that uh, control the um, voluntary muscle movement, in the spinal cord and in the brain. And basically when you have nerve generation of this motor neuron, uh, you have muscle atrophy and indeed the patient with ILS, they, um, they have like a range of uh, um, symptoms from um, difficulty of walking, uh, difficulty of speech, swallowing, they, they uh, experience um, also a weakness in the upper and or the lower body. And I mean, a lot of, of uh, work has been done to try to understand also um, specific mutations that are um, that cause different forms of ILS. And here I put a table with like all the uh, uh, mutation that the genes that have been discovered so far. And again, as an immunologist, what caught my attention is that several of these genes they are also involved in the regulation of the immune system. Like for example, FAST, CDP43, they regulate the NFKB NF activation. We have optinurin, sequestrosome, TBK1. They are like main regulator of, um, of autophagy. C9 has been also been involved to uh, regulate inflammation in microglia and macrophages. And so this to me suggested that this probably um, also an immunocomponent in some form of ILS. And indeed, I choose this uh, gene senataxin for the reason that I just explained to you that is linked to uh, ILS-4. Uh, and so basically, um, as I said, this is a juvenile, slow progressive form of ILS. And there are like three mutations that have been identified and the far most common of them it's uh, the mutation L389S, but we don't know how this uh, mutation affects the function of the protein and why it causes um, ILS. But what is uh, interesting is that, uh, interesting, what is um, um, good for us is that senataxin is, is very well conserved um, between human and mice. And so because of that, mice that express exactly the same mutation as human, have been generated that what I call the setax knocking mice. And they also have a progressive motor phenotype that you can start to detect when these mice are eight months of age. And so what I did, I just um, asked the group that developed these mice, it's a group of uh, Arvel Laspada that now is uh, a UC Irvine. And I got these mice and my idea was, okay, Let's see, let's immunophenotype these mice. Let's see if there is any immunodysfunction that can be linked to, to the disease. And so this is a, um, the, the, first, the very first experiment that I did because I didn't know if, again, there was any role of the immune system in the disease. And I generated uh, bone marrow um, chimera. So basically what you do, you take the wild type mice, you take these Noki mice, and you literally radiate them. So by doing that, you completely de deplete their hematopoietic system. And so all the cells of the immune system. And then what you do, you reconstitute these mice with bone marrow cells uh, from either wild type or um, no mice. 
And so by doing that, um, I generated these four groups of cameras. So two groups controlled with what I call wild type, wild type, that they didn't express the mutation at all, or this knocking, knocking, they were knocking mice and that were reconstituted with bone marrow cells from other knocking mice. So the mutation is expressed everywhere. But I also had these knocking wild type mice in which the um, uh, pathologic form of setex was expressed only in the immune system and not in the central nervous system, or the wild type knocking in which the mutation is expressed only in the central nervous system, but not in the hematopoietic system. By the way, guys, feel free to ask me any question if at some point I'm not clear. So I generated these four groups of mice and then I tested them for uh, motor um, impairment. And uh, first of all, I used the, the rota rod, which is the, like a kind of uh, um, a very common uh, way to test motor um, impairment in mice. So basically you put the mice um, on this road, you have an accelerating road, and then the length of time that the mice stays on the road, the, each single mouse stays on the road, it's like a measure of um, motor coordination and strength. And so you can see in this um, graph, I always do three trials to be sure that um, uh, the results are consistent. And you call like light latency to fall means you, you look at how long these mice they stay on the road. And yeah, uh, when we look at the control that is at the white dot and then the, the gray dot, so um, these mice that express, uh, these chimeric mice that express the mutation everywhere, they indeed, they had a motor impairment uh, as compared to the wild type control. And it showed that the radiation and the bomaric constitution did affect the capacity of these mice to develop a phenotype. But the very interesting result was that when the um, mutation was expressed only in the central nervous system or only in the immune system, uh, the mice, mice they didn't develop um, a motor impairment. And we confirmed that by looking at the area of motor neuron in the spinal cord and also the number of big axons in the sciatic nerve. And so together these results, they suggested that to develop the disease, at least in mice, um, you need a factor that uh, an immuno, you also have, the, you need the contribution of uh, um, the immune system. And so we try, I try to understand which um, cell subset of the immune system could be affected by this mutation. And so I started with the innate immune system because as I told you, uh, everything started when people in the lab, they just discovered that uh, lack of setex increased the um, uh, inflammatory response in innate immune cells after infection. So we said, okay, let's see if this mutation L389S recapitulate what we have seen in the knockout cells. And so I used bone marrow derivative cells here infected with Cidrobacter rodentium, which is a pathogen, is a bacteria that is a, a natural rodent pathogen equivalent of E. coli in, uh, in humans. And what is good is that it induces a high like RF3 dependent and interferon dependent um, type 1 interferon response. And so then I compare the knockout cells um, when, when they were compared to the control, uh, they um, express higher level of interferon beta and IL-6, but I didn't see any difference when I compared these um, knocking cells um, to their wild type control. And I also infect these cells with influenza. I tried to stimulate them with CIGAM to stimulate the steam pathway. And I didn't see any difference in the um, in their inflammatory response. And so then I was like, okay, what happened here? I had my chimeric mice and uh, I was like, okay, let's analyze as immunophenotype the, um, uh, the immune system, these uh, um, chimeric mice and see what happened. And so I did the site of experiment. So there's this um, um, mass um, cytometry when you can uh, use more than 30 marker at the same time. 
and I took the blood of uh, um, this different group of chimeric mice and uh, I look at different population, innate immunocells, adaptive immunocells, and consistent with what I saw in vitro, I didn't see any particular um, phenotype in the innate immunocells. But when I look at the T-cell compartment, I found that this population of CD80 cells, um, um, so if you, there was a, um, a very increase, a large increase in CD80 cells that expressed this marker PD1. And this was specifically uh, in the peripheral blood, but I also had data in the center of the system of the uh, group of chimeric mice that developed the disease. And so I was kind of puzzled that point because uh, I have to be honest, we really thought that this was um, an innate immunophenotype because also um, everything that show you at the beginning, all these genes that be um, associated uh, with ILS and the, they mainly control the innate immune system, but not the adaptive immune system. And so I check in the literature and what was known and I, I just, um, I found that uh, T cells actually there are, and especially CD8 T cells that have been shown to uh, really be involved in the, in, in the, in the brain. They, they can mediate cognitive dysfunction when upper infection with the neuropathogenic flavivirus. Uh, you can have these memory resident T cells in a human brain. They also, CD80 cells controls the um, aging and inter by interacting with the uh, neurogenic niches. And they, finally, there was this uh, paper about Alzheimer's disease that showed that you have this chronic expanded CD80 cells population um, in Alzheimer patient. And so this made me, made me like more comfortable about my results. So what I did, I went back to my regular mice. These are not, not chimeric mice, the wild type and nokin. And I look at the presence of these activated CD80 cells that express PD-1 in different organs and at different age. And I found an increase in these cells statistically significant when I compare uh, nokin and wild type mice. Um, specifically in the spinal cord, in the brain, and then in the blood of Nokia mice starting at six months of age. In the blood, I can detect this difference um, a little bit later, eight months. And you have also fax blood for people that like fax that you, you see the what happened in the spinal cord in eight months uh, old mice. And I also check other organs. So I checked the spleen, I checked the lungs, and I, I didn't see any difference in other organs. So these cells, they were increased only in the central nervous system. And at that time, that for me was kind of interesting because when I tested these, when I knock in mice by Rotarod, I, I started to detect a motor impairment uh, when they were eight months of age. So uh, this is suggests to me that this population increased just before these mice that show phenotype. And then it keeps increasing and this phenotype is stronger in the spinal cord uh, while the disease, as the disease um, uh, progresses. And so, of course, then the, 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 um, the question was like, what are these, uh, um, um, oh, I think here I skip. Sorry, when I did my PowerPoint, I skipped one, <laughs> one slide, but it's okay. I was just trying to understand uh, what these PD-1 positive cells they were because uh, um, PD-1 is mainly known as a, as a marker of exhaustion that is not expressed in the um, functional cells, but indeed these cells, they were functional because in vitro they were able to produce um, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma. And so to better understand the phenotype, um, I, I'm, I, I uh, um, did a sequencing of these cells and I found that these cells, they were expressing a high level of this transcription factor that is called TOX. And again, uh, why I, I was puzzled, like what, what does it mean? And I went back to the literature and uh, I found that uh, TOX is a, uh, um, a very up is uh, highly upregulated in cells that undergo uh, um, chronic antigenic stimulation. So the T cells express 
this T cell receptor uh, that allow them to uh, recognize a, a specific antigen. And when the cells that recognize this antigen like over and over again, apparently they upregulate this um, um, transcription factor, this tox. And this has been observed in a human in this paper from Science Immunology when they look at different population CD80 cells in the peripheral human blood. And they found that TMRAL CD80 cells, which are a population of terminal differentiated CD80 cells, they express high level of tox and low level of another transcription factor that is TCF1. Now, mice that don't have TMRA, but when I look in the literature about mice, I found that indeed this signature is tox high, TCF1 low, together with expression of PD1 and another um, um, uh, regulatory um, receptor digit is characteristic of autoreactive CD80 cells in mice. So in autoreactive uh, CD80 cells, so, so CD80 cells that react to self-antigen in the central nervous system, but also, for example, in the model of type 1 diabetes. And so I went back to my cells, uh, my mice, and I, I took my symptomatic knocking mice, I look in the spinal cord, in the blood, and I want to see if uh, this PD-1 positive CD80 cells they also express this signature. And indeed, as compared to PD-1 negative, they upregulate TOX, TGIT, and downregulated TCF1. And of course, you, you have a quantification from different mice. And so, so far, what my conclusion was that uh, at least in mice, um, the immune compartment contributes to motor neuron disease in these uh, um, CETAX L389S uh, animals. And when I was looking for, when I was looking for um, immune dysfunction, what I found were I, this population of CD80 cells expressing the micro PD-1, they were highly expanded, expanded specifically in the central nervous system and in the blood of the symptomatic mice. And these cells express marker of cells that are are chronically stimulated like the TMRA in humans and autoreactive T cells. And so at that point, uh, the idea is that, okay, uh, are these cells maybe autoreactive? So the cells that react in response to an antigen that is expressed um, um, by the host. Um, first of all, to determine that, I needed to know if these cells that can be, um, they were activated in an antigen dependent uh, way. So just like quickly, just to be, uh, what does it mean? So um, again, when you look at the immune system, you have innate immune cells and adaptive immune cells and innate immune cells that are not specific to antigen, but they react to um, um, conserved molecules uh, that are expressed by um, different families of pathogens. These cells and B cells, they have the capability to recognize a specific antigens. And they, in the case of T cells, they, their main uh, activator is the TCR, for the T cell re receptor, which is expressed on this, which uh, actually the, um, the TCR is generated when the uh, precursor of T cells are in the thymus, is generated by um, um, random uh, recombination of DNA sequences. And so um, the TCR, it's in, in general, is uh, um, unique to each T cell and it uh, defines uh, the antigen specificity. So what happens when you have a function, you have the successful um, generation of these uh, uh, functional TCR, then you have these um, non-activated CD4, CD80 cells that they go to the periphery. And eventually, they interact with the innate immune cells that are called APC, antigen-presenting cells. And these cells are responsible for the processing and the presentation of uh, antigenic peptide to the MHC class 2 in the case of CD4, or MHC class 1 in the case of CD8. And so these antigenic peptide, they can derive, of course, from a pathogen. Uh, they can derive from proteins that are expressed by the host itself. Or you can have, in the case, for example, of tumors, uh, generation of a, a completely new antigen. 
what is interesting here to um, understand is what is important here to understand is when a T cell express, uh, um, uh, sorry, when a T cell um, um, recognize its cognate antigen, it start to um, um, actively proliferate. So you have a clonal population of T cells that express uh, the same um, TCR sequence because they are all generated from the same cells. And why I'm telling you all of that? Because the, the way that we had to understand if these PD1 positive CD80 cells were generated in an antigen dependent way was to look at their um, TCR sequence. And so I sorted the PD1 positive and negative CD80 cells from the central nervous system of symptomatic knocking mice. And then we uh, perform a TCR um, sequencing. And you have here this bar, each bar is one mouse. And you have like both PD1 positive and negative, and each color corresponds to a one sequence. And you can see that in the PD1 positive, uh, one or two sequence, they um, comprise the 60% of the entire repertoire, which is not the case in a PD-1 negative. And so this means that when you uh, when you have the um, one or two TCR sequence that are overrepresented in a population of T cells, it means that these you add like antigen recognition and expansion of the same clone. And we see also the same. Uh, um, the same result in the blood, even if uh, the this clonality was not as striking. But more interesting, when we we, we compare the uh, most expressed sequence TCR sequence in the blood in the central of the system, and we had an overlap between sixty and eighty percent, meaning that this PD one CD eighty cells that we also saw in the peripheral blood, they were the same that we could detect in the spinal cord. And so again, this. Uh, the second conclusion is that these cells indeed expand in response to an antigen, but which antigen? And and then um, so this was complicated. So um, mice are in a pathogen-free facility. So to me, it was not um, possible that this antigen was derived from a pathogen. And also the fact that these cells they were found. Um, only in the spinal cord, in the brain, and in the brain, and then they were recirculated in the blood, okay, but they were mostly found uh, there, not in other organs. So just to me that if it was an antigen involved, this antigen was probably um, uh, an antigen that was in the, uh, present only in the central nervous system. Now, so these cells, they could have been like autoreactive cells um, reacting to a cell derived antigen. Now, how do you, how do you uh, prove that? This is very complicated because um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to um, activate ex vivo cells that are specific to um, a cell-derived antigen. And so I had to be very creative there. And I start looking around and I thought about the fact that um, Indeed, autoimmunity is kind of the other side of the coin of uh, um, um, anti-tumor immunity because when you have a, a tumor, you want cells that uh, are able to recognize an antigen that is expressed by tumor cells, which are also cells that are these cells are derived from the host. And I was looking also um, a paper in the, another form of uh, ILS, the C9 ILS. And uh, people suggested that um, that epidemiological study had shown that these patients they um, are more susceptible to autoimmunity and less susceptible to certain kind of cancer. And so what I did then, okay, I tested if my knocking mice that I had this increased population of uh, CD80 cells, they uh, were. Um, able to be uh, more resistant to a certain kind of cancer. And so I took this wild type and optimized one year old, so the age again that these knocking mice, they were symptomatic. And one group of mice was injected. Uh, um, so I did this injection um, in the flank uh, because I didn't want any confusing result with what was happening in the, the central nervous system. So one group was injected with these uh, um, glioma-derived neurostem cells. 
uh, one another group was injected with um, these B16 cancer cells that in, um, um, trigger like that, that um, generate melanoma. And at the day that I need to sacrifice the wild type mice because this glioma was too big, these knocking mice, the dead tumor was very, very small. And you can see then that the, I followed the tumor growth of the, over the time. But on the other hand, I didn't see any uh, big difference in the um, melanoma growth. And I did some histology taking this uh, glioma from the uh, Nokina wild type mice. And I also did um, a CD80 cell staining. And you can see here I, in this brown dot, and I found that there was an increased infiltration of CD80 cells in the tumor in Nokin uh, mice as compared to wild type mice. And again, I also took these cells and we did a TCR sequencing and it looks like uh, there were some cells that uh, the, some of the most expressed TCR sequence that were common between the um, tumor and the uh, PD-1 CD80 cells in the spinal cord. And so that to me suggested that that's, it's, it's a big correlation, but uh, is was telling that these PD-1 CD80 cells that are expanded in the um, central nervous system, they uh, are functional and they recognize um, uh, antigens that are derived from the central nervous system because they can move from the spinal cord and then go and protect the mice against uh, uh, neural stem cells that have tumors. But they don't do the same when you inject them with melanoma. So it means that they are very specific for something that is expressed in the central nervous system. And so that in parallel, when I was having this result, I started wondering if this was, okay, this was true in mice, but what about patient? And so I start collecting peripheral blood from ILS for patient. And I actually did the same that I did with my chimeric mice. So just uh, here I use cytometry, the Aurora. And I, I took peripheral blood of this patient and I choose to have healthy control of the same age and the same sex possibly. And again, I immunophenotype, I tried to characterize all the cells and uh, there was a cluster of this gray, um, that uh, gray here that really caught my attention. And what I look at the, what the, where these cells that were highly rich in the ILS4 patient, they were indeed uh, TMRA cells that in uh, humans are uh, CD45 RA, uh, CD28 negative. So uh, as uh, Nokimize, also ILS for patient, they were um, enriched in this population of TMRA CD80 cells. And then we did a single cell sequencing. So we use the side seq when you can do RNA expression, but you can also use some, um, uh, you also sequence some antibody at the surface. And actually, we could reconstitute a different population of naive central memory, effector memory, TMRA CD80 cells. And when you look control and ILS4, there is this population that is highly enriched ILS4 patient that is uh, corresponding to the TMRA CD80 cells. And uh, um, these cells, they also we look at their gene expression, they were highly activated. And we also um, did in parallel the TCR sequencing of these cells. And then we, what we found is that it was this population that we call hyperexpanded cells. So one TCR was expressed by more than 100 cells. And these, when you look at the um, site seq profile versus the TCR sequencing profile, these cells in, that are in, in red, they, they um, these hyperexpanded CD80 cells, they were indeed these uh, TMRA CD80 cells that we found in patient. And we also quantified um, this in, uh, you can see in these uh, donuts. Um, we didn't find, so um, the, this hyperexpansion of TMRA CD80 cells in any of the control. Now, um, this was confirming uh, that we had this kind of the same signature in patient and mice. Uh, now, again, my hypothesis was that these cells, they were um, 
auto-reactive, but um, of course in mice it's easier because you have these animals that are in the pathogen-free um, facilities, but in humans it's kind of complicated. So what I did, I, I, I used this, uh, I bought this like a pool of peptide that are uh, class one restricted, what means class one restricted, these are peptide that can be recognized by um, specifically by CDAG cells. And these are peptides derived from um, several, see here the list of the most common pathogens in human. And then I stimulate these cells from uh, peripheral blood, CDAG cells for ILS4 patient and control. And I look at activation of CD80 cells upon stimulation by measuring the interferon gamma production. And you can see it was the production of interferon gamma was similar between control and allies for, for patient, meaning that uh, these um, highly expanded increased population of CD80 cells that I found in the peripheral blood was not specific to um, any of these. Um, uh, pathogen that I tested. And so finally, um, this was really um, hard because it's um, this disease is really rare, but I could manage to find at least two uh, um, post-mortem, uh, there were two uh, patients that donated their um, organs uh, after they died and so these are less for patient and uh, um, I'm, we perform um, um, a lumbar um, tissue section from the spinal cords or less for patient and um, here we are in the ventral horn it's the uh, the spinal cord where you have the motor neuron that are these big cells in general, the cells are not in the parenchyma, but in this patient, we found these CD80 cells that were um, going into the tissue, and we didn't find the same, we didn't find CD80 cells in the spinal cord of non ILS patient, and we didn't find uh, these uh, CD80 cells in the parenchyma from, um, um, the, for example, the um, cortical brain tissue, uh, from the same ILS for patient. And so that was the conclusion of this work. So um, again, um, this, uh, the immune system looks important for the disease in these uh, ILS for mice and uh, mice and in these mice, we found this TMRA like PD-1 CD80 cells in the central of the system in the blood and these cells, they confer resistance against glioma, suggesting uh, that are probably they recognize an antigen that is expressed in the center of the system. I also tested other two um, mouse models of ILS using the SOD1 and the FAST mice, but I didn't see the same phenotype. Uh, like I didn't see any aberrant CD80 cells uh, expansion in the central nervous system of these mice when they were symptomatic. Now, this could suggest that this, probably this phenotype is specific to some form of ILS, uh, but I have to say that I am collaborating and talking to um, um, some clinician and that um, they also see uh, these uh, CD80 cells in the cerebral spinal fluid of patient of that uh, have uh, um, SOD1 mutation. So I don't know, there can be a, because the, sometimes the mice, they don't match humans, or uh, I don't know, let's say I'm not pretty uh, confident anymore that this is something specific to ILS4, let's, let's say like that. Uh, but yeah, we, did, we got this result in mice, we got this, um, an equivalent population of Timra CD80 cells highly expanded in the peripheral blood of patient and these cells can also be found in the um, parenchyma of the spinal cord of the same patient and what what i think this is the significance of this work i, I think um, first of all this is gonna maybe help us to uh, understand the disease mechanism so this is a really a complex disease and um you know until more like 10 years ago, we thought that the center of the system and the immune system, they were completely separate compartment that were independently, um, they were completely independent. Now we know that these two compartments, they really interact. And so 
maybe to understand this kind of diseases that are really complicated, we should also try to look at the immune system. Uh, as I said at the beginning, ILS, are, it's a group of heterogeneous disease. And so I think it's very important to understand what is common to this disease to find like um, a therapy for everybody. But it's also important to understand what is different and what is peculiar to different form of ILS uh, for the purpose of diagnosis, but also because like this, we can tailor our treatment uh, in the way that are going to be more efficient in different groups of patients. And finally, this is this is the model that I'm working on. And so I uh, this is I mean so this is my I draw by this one myself. So these are my motor neurons on the left that are healthy, and then if they express this attacks L389S, you see now that they become pretty ugly. Are these like kind of um, I don't brownish motor neurons and. Um, I think this is the first the first step of the disease. I think the disease started with the um, neurodegeneration of motor neurons because if you take these motor neurons from leukemia, if you take the neurons from leukemia mice and what type of mice that you put in culture, the leukemia neurons they are more prone to die. So there is something intrinsic in the in these motor neurons that the, this this mutation make them more fragile. But then. At the same time, what something happened, maybe there is an inflammatory environment, maybe there are other cells like microglia involved. Uh, you have this proliferation, this activation of CD80 cells that are these brown cells uh, in green. And what is interesting and why these cells, these cells expand and then uh, you have a progression of the disease while these CD80 cells expand. Now, how these CD80 cells are doing and what is their role specifically in the disease I something it's something that I'm really trying to investigate right now and then I put the, just a, a, a last slide of uh, acknowledgement because of course um, I, I had the help from um, a lot of people people from my lab uh, Albert Laspada's group they helped me with uh, they give me the mice and I, I have to collaborate with people um, with clinician for the tissues, but also like to um, um, a, a patient and uh, and yeah, there is like uh, we have collaborator the, um, Sean Chizari is the second author of my paper and uh, he did the single cell analysis. This is a guy who was first year um, uh, PhD student, so amazing guy, a guy and okay, the funding. Uh, I thank you and I'm open to any kind of question. Thank you so, so much, um, Laura, for that wonderful presentation. I'm pretty sure a lot of people on stage and in the audience have a lot of questions for you. Um, but I saw you unmuted, Katerina. Do you have something? So, such interesting work. I really always had, like, I had this theory for for like years that, you know, the communication between um, the neural um, system and the immune system is very important. That turns disease into a chronic state. And then it's very, um, so this this work is fascinating. And uh, yeah, it, it makes me really happy that you got, you know, funding for this and you went for this. So congratulations, Laura. Yeah, and I have to say, just like, it was pretty hard because uh, um, we, it, I mean, uh, that's true that now this is start to be like more a trend, like the T cells and the neurodegenerative disease. But when I started this project, uh, people, they thought I was completely crazy. And it was really difficult to get this project, uh, to get funds for, the, for this project. We got this... Uh, CZI from the Zuckerberg Foundation that it was actually um, kind of easy to get because it was a foundation and they like just to have really bold like crazy project uh, because yeah does it just just like to tell you guys don't get discouraged because so just go and with your data because it's true that sometimes uh, people don't believe you don't think that what you do is interesting but 
sometimes they are just wrong. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> sometimes they're just wrong. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Jamie, do you have any questions? Um, I just I had this one for you. It's very interesting when you were telling about your discoveries here. Did you have the, any opportunity to examine this in the mice through like hereditary, like um, any any like um, babies or anything like that? Did they have the the same results to it? Was anything passed on, or or maybe you didn't have a chance to do that in this particular study? So can you repeat? I think I did. Oh, which a, a, a bigger, a bigger pun. I, oh. I was, um, I was wondering with all of the findings that you were describing to us, if you had had the chance with the mice to see any uh, how any of this is passed on, um, through inheritance with the the babies or anything. If you saw the exact same, um, sort of symptoms in in the the baby mice or anything like that, or perhaps that might be a different study. So. No, I mean this. This this is familiar form of ILS, and uh, so in both mice and humans. So this uh, um, is a um, so it goes through the, like it is our autosomal dominant. So the progeny has unfortunately who get this mutation uh, get sick. Um, this phenotype is not found in very young mice because. Um, uh, the, the mice that start to get sick um, when they are like eight months of age. Uh, so, um, and I detect these cells uh, when the mice are like six months of age. But I, I analyzed younger mice and I didn't see that. Um, so I, I, I think this is not something that you, this is something that is just like, as I can say, is a progressive phenotype. And so probably a very young mice, there is, there is, there is no difference between the um, ILS for mice and the wild type mice. If I, if I, did I get your question? Ah, uh, yeah, that that was it. Thank you very much for indulging Thank me. Thank you. you. All right, uh, Denise, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you so much for this uh, amazing presentation. I was struck immediately by this being influenza and given that there is another pathogen in the family Coronaviridae currently wreaking havoc on this planet, I was curious if there were any implications uh, for the SARS-2 pandemic, your findings in that disease. I mean, um, it would be interesting to understand um, if these patients are more susceptible or not to virus, but um, to viral infection, whatever infection. I mean, the, the 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 patient that I have so far, the group is too. Is, I have two. Um, there are so few patients I cannot conclude. Um, what I can tell you is that when you when you don't express these proteins and a toxin, uh, you have a higher expression of inflammatory genes. So. Um, Based on like I did some studies in COVID, like mice, SARS CoV 2, and um, the, the problem is that in there is that the, the inflammatory response at some point become too, um, um, you, you have an exaggerated inflammatory response that what makes you sick, what it, like kind of uh, um, damage also the organs of the host. So if this protein plays a role, uh, it would not be good, like because this protein, if it's not expressed, then inflammation is too 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 um, acute. It's too um, you have too much um, inflammatory. Um, 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 you have sorry, the expression inflammatory genes is too high, so it could be uh, damaging. So if I I would I would guess, but in regular people, satex is functional, so we'll, we are able to regulate our inflammatory response. Got it. Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. Dr. Shah. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. That was a fascinating work. I was a little bit late. My question from you, because you mentioned about the interferon gamma, and it seems that you didn't find the, um, I mean, significant relationship between your pathogens and the interferon gamma. However, we know that the level of the interferon gamma beside the for example, some of the factor as a 
pro-inflammatory IL-6, IL-8, or TNF. So it's gonna elevate it in patient and some of the patients based upon the type of the ALS, which is that spinal or vulva from the starting point has a different result. I was just wondering because it's a animal study and I wanna hear what is your thought around that? So, I mean, I, um, I don't know which experiment were you referring at? Because um, I mean, in, in mice, um, so these cells they don't secrete just interferon gamma; they express interferon gamma, TNF alpha, granzyme. So the experiment that I did um, in vitro with the, the peripheral blood of ILS four patient, uh, the redoubt was interferon gamma, but it, it, it was just a, a redoubt for uh, CD eighty cells activation, just to see uh, if the response against pathogen was higher in patient than in the control, which was not the case. Then if you are asking me about uh, um, um, like what, what exactly um, um, the function, the effect of function of these cells, I, I agree with you. I think that it's probably not restricted to interferon gamma, but this is what just a uh, a redoubt you can look at IL2 just to see if the cells are getting activated ex, ex vivo, but in vivo is different. Yeah, I, I agree. And we are talking about the peripheral adoptive immunity, right? Specifically, when we are talking about IFN gamma, I, w I want to be sure that you have emphasis on the peripheral yeah. adoptive immunity. Yeah. And also, did you just uh, had uh, elevated on a CPR and all of those inflammation factors or markers? If I have, sorry? For other inflammatory factors like a CPR and all of those elements, ESR and all of, all of those things, did you add any result from that part as well? No, I just look at the T-cell uh, phenotype. And then I look at that, I, we did... Uh, um, a single cell sequencing of these CD80 cells. So the, they express like um, granzyme, perforine, perforine a, um, marker of um, activation, but just like we look just on CD80 cells. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. All right, Gilbert. Gilbert, are you here? Okay, then I guess Victoria, hi. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for a very lovely presentation. And I'm curious because you are connected to the microbiology department. If you explored um, differences in the microbiome of the, um, the mice that you studied to see if there were any discernible differences there. That, um... I didn't, but uh, I, I agree with you that that would be interesting. Yeah, uh, I didn't, but that's, that's true. That's at some point we thought about that. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have an answer, but yeah, this is something you're completely right. It would be interesting to look at that. All right, then. Um... Does anyone else in the audience or on stage have any questions for Laura? Um, please post your questions in the chat if you don't want to come up on stage or you can raise your hand and come up on stage and ask a question. Um, I guess I have yeah. one oh, follow-up sure. question, if it's okay. Oh, no, I'm just on. curious, Laura, um, what do you think the implications are for the, um, for tr basically for future treatments based on the findings of your study? I mean, and again, like, I, I, there are a lot of like work that needs to be done, but let's say if there is a, a role of the, of, of the cells, I think that could be also good um, good news in the sense that um, you can manipulate the cells. Uh, um, uh, I think in a, it's, it's easier to manipulate the cells than neurons. For example, you can deplete. A population of CD80 cells, and of course, you cannot deplete a population of neurons. So um, there is like a, there are a lot of uh, um, immuno um, um, so molecules that you can use. So, but also I think like more in general, um, 
it it would be like important to think about um like um different factors that can um um can participate to the disease i'm saying that because i i met with clinician that um, um are treating sod one or fast patient with um, um oligo antisense that what you, that you inject is oligo you you try to um correct the genetic defect and they told me that they the results are um a kind of partial because the, the, they they believe that what happened is that you start with the genetic defect and these for example um neurons motor neurons but then after that you activate a cascade of events and so what be maybe they were saying maybe if we are able to combine different kind of treatment treatment that are um maybe uh, genetic therapies together with an anti-inflammatory or by targeting some uh, particular population of the immune system that's something that we, we could get a uh, better result so I, I think that there are two 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 ways to see that to, to look at that the way like yeah really trying to see if the t-cells plays a role because these cells can be targeted easily, but uh, um, also try to understand when we do a, ter um, a therapy for this patient, that's probably we don't need, we need to target more than one cell subset to get result. Thank you. All right. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, um, thank you so much um, for answering all of that. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, so um, how good will you be able to use this also as an early diagnosis? Is that also something you can do maybe pretty early, like pretty soon? Yeah, this is a, it's, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I now I don't know because um, I had like, so I, I didn't have patient young enough, but of course this in the um, one idea is that because also this is a, a form of ILS that is progressive. So you have also like uh, um, patient that are kids or like uh, teenagers. So the idea, it would be to look at that. So if there is in mice, we know that there is a, a correlation like the, the between the, the these cells increase before the symptoms and then you have a correlation between the number of these cells and uh, um, how much it gets uh, like the, the the symptoms of these mice how strong they are the symptoms in humans so far i don't know but it would be interesting if i can have enough patient at different stage to, from different age to look at that yeah yeah, that's interesting because we also had the guest speaker. She found a T cell um, activity difference in Alzheimer's. So maybe it could be, you know, a more broad, um, you know, applied principle basically to, you know, diagnose early and then also deliver some sort of treatment um, um, that way. So. Uh, no, that you're right because in this paper on Alzheimer's disease, they see that again, the um, the increased number of uh, like the, the um, there was a positive correlation between the number of these TMR CD80 cells and the um, loss of uh, um, cognitive function. So uh, again, uh, these were patients that they use in this Alzheimer. It's paper that you know when you have a sporadic disease, sporadic disease is kind of tricky to understand. Like you, you have the patient when they are already pretty sick. Now, are these cells present in in pre-symptomatic Alzheimer patient? Uh, can we detect any, for example, susceptibility? Uh, that would be a good question. But yes, it, I think it's, it, it's, it would be difficult to assess at least in humans but we can start with mice and see yeah the other question is if you think oh sorry i'm with my kids in the car um the other thing is if if there's a predisposition do you think there there would be one 
Sorry, I think I cannot hear you anymore. There's something. Yeah, you muted there, Katarina, for a second. You cut out. Yeah. That may indicate um, she's having connectivity issues. I thought she had asked if there was any predisposition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so if you can detect in these patients in the T cells a, maybe a vulnerability of overreacting basically and contributing to this um, neurodegeneration. Yeah, no, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's something that. I think it's maybe more feasible in when you have a familiar form of this disease, like test to test what you're saying. It's probably we should start with people that have a familiar form and see like um, in a family uh, with their history of ILS or Alzheimer's disease, uh, if there is any specific uh, marker in their CD8 cells and that this is going to predict uh, they have a predisposition to disease. Yes, definitely. Um, that would be great because then you can also predict in people that uh, don't have a familiar history of uh, neurodegenerative disease. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing would, you know, if the other thing what would make this interesting in case there's a predisposition or not is that maybe you could. Uh, find, um, I, I don't know, but maybe, for example, if people that have a high vulnerability for these disorders, probably an occurrence of like a severe uh, inflammation through viral infection or any kind of, you know, bacterial infection would be really bad for them. So it would be maybe, you know, if you could do this pre-screening pretty early on in life, you could maybe suppress the immune system during those um, those uh, stressors that, that would make them have maybe the disease progress faster or an early onset or maybe delay it more. That, that's my thought for the no, future. No. No, I think you are right, and I think in um, in the at least in the, in the field of uh, the Alzheimer disease, um, now this um, uh, these labs they are trying to understand if there is a link between infection and uh, um, um, the CD eighty cell response and uh, um, uh, Alzheimer disease and this kind of thing, but um, yeah, and I'm trying to understand if there is anything like specific, like there is a, what, what what is wrong with CD80 cells? And then uh, I agree and see if there is any um, other component like uh, infection or uh, like we were said, the microbiome that can um, affect the, 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 the cells in the disease. And so can we prevent some from that? Because yeah, can, can we do something about to prevent the disease? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are around an hour, like we went around an hour. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask, um, you know, how much time we have left if we need to uh, basically leave the room. <laughs> And um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, um, if you if there is any further question, I'm happy to answer. Like, um, yeah, I can go on with questions if nobody else has one. Maybe I'll ask another one, and then. So, so what are you planning um, right now next or probably are you already working on um, the next step? Um, what, what's in, in the future? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm really, really um, curious about the role of these cells. If they really like uh, have a role, they, they are a marker of disease, if they really participate actively to the disease is one thing and I'm interested in that these cells, uh, they can be also found in other form of ILS. So if, did you try to do culture maybe 
with uh, modern neurons that you know have basically started the damage and then um you know have them in a basically in the T cell environment that is kind of regular. I don't know if that works at all to see basically if healthy, normal, I don't know if that even is a thing, T cells can basically stop the progress. Like if the neurodegeneration slows down or stops in a healthy environment, basically. Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, it's something that I would like to do. I need to deal like with the very few these cells there, um, um, in mice at least, uh, like the, the number of these cells is not great and they look pretty fragile like, when you take out from the mouse. I mean, I think this is something that you have with the two cells that are in the tissue. They um, are not very good um, surviving after but uh, yeah definitely this is something uh, that I, I really want to I already want to do before sending the paper I then I, I, I try a couple of things that didn't work really well but uh, I, I, this is something that is worth like troubleshooting and doing yeah I I, I didn't try but yeah, this is a fantastic idea yeah yeah, maybe in a humanized immune system mouse model that you can out of the disease model regular. I'm not sure if it will work, but this humanized um, immune um, model and then see if it works more. I don't know if you, if you get hands on human. Um, You're in the matrix, Katarina. Is it Sorry, I couldn't hear well. No, uh, basically designed the experiment if you, if you can hear me, but um, a little bit better. My <laughs> yeah, can no, you've gone out again. <laughs> It's not just me, right? She's no, no you cannot hear. <laughs> okay. Um, if you can, Katarina, maybe type your question in the chat, and you know we can just read it out. Yeah, her question. Is uh, okay, I see. Use mouse model with human immune system. Uh, uh yes and no, in the sense that uh, these um these mice. Uh, the central of the system is still a neural central of the system. So uh, the problem is that uh, it's, it's difficult to model interaction between the central of the system, its mouth, and if the immune system, it's human, because you also have a mismatch like uh, antigen presentation and this kind of thing. It's not going to really um, work if the for immunized mice, you mean this. I mean, the immunized mice basically are this. This is the mice that are highly deficient for cells of the immune system, in cells of the immune system, and then you reconstitute them. So, um, yeah, but that, but you can still like play, like you can do IPS in vitro, for example, or for and do this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that, that, I think. Yeah, if you irradiate, that's the thing. Like, if you can also irradiate the immune system, the point is that the center of the system is still the murine one. So that you're going to have a kind of a mouse in which you have a human immune system and the uh, um, mouse center of the system, and they're not going to talk to each other because they're not going to um, be able to do that because they, there is a mismatch. Uh, but um, I, I think, yeah, you can... You can do in vitro, for example, do motor neurons derived from, I don't know, IPS. I don't know if this is possible. For sure, you can do neurons from IPS and then incubate this with the, with the cells from a patient. That's definitely a space ball. Yeah. Or do like motor neurons from mice, incubate them with the cells from mice. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I don't know. Yeah, it's going on. Thank you.
Sorry, Katarina, it hasn't gotten any better. Maybe the chat <laughs> is the best option. Yeah, no, we can't hear you at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Katarina. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. I mean, <laughs> All right. I guess, yeah, I guess she's just signing off for now. Um, all right. So I don't know. Does anybody else have any last questions? Um, because I think Laura, yeah, Laura's time might be up. Yeah. Oh, Jamie? I have no more questions, but I have no more questions, but I'd like to just thank you very, very much for your time and I've very fascinating talk and i hope you can actually come back again sometime with any new findings that you have for us we'd really appreciate that it's been a pleasure having you doctor great thank you me too i hope i'm gonna have more funding but uh, again i really appreciate guys that your interest and passion for science and uh, thank you for having me here it was really a pleasure yeah thanks for coming thank you for taking the time um we always 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 like to have you back um katarina have you worked out the issue <laughs> yeah thank you so much uh if you can hear me i wish yeah you, yeah you know, much better now <laughs> perfect all the best for your future and i'm very curious to you know follow along your research and uh, your views so Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, all the best for your future, guys, for sure. Like, you are very, very uh, great. Uh, it was very great to talk to you. Like, fantastic question and comments. So, thank you. Uh, good night. Thank you. Oh, and we also thank you. Have uh, a great we rest of your day. Wish you all the funding as well, because that's what we do at Science Science. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All the funding. <laughs> so, Absolutely. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye, Thank you. Bye, Laura. Ending the room in three, two, one.